20 years ago, a teenage boy found an ancient cannon under here. He discovered it was part of a ship that had been wrecked here off the Devon coast some 400 years ago, but we still don't know the actual identity of the ship. After all those hundreds of years under the water, is there still enough of it remaining for us to be able to work out what it was and what it was doing in these waters? Can the time team finally solve the mystery of the Tynmouth wreck? Just about. I <laughs> don't want it to get much rougher. They're dead lucky. Ah. The weather we usually get on time too. Welcome aboard, Tony. Uh, this Tony. is uh, Roger and Simon. Simon. Welcome aboard, Tony. Thank Good you. to see you. And it's your side? Absolutely, yes. So where exactly is the wreck? Well, just about where that orange survey vessel is. She's just about right over it now, actually. It's right in close, isn't it? It is. At low tide, you can stand there. Yeah? Yeah they are undertaking a survey. Well, just like the geophysics. So it's exactly the same as we normally do, yeah. You see they're towing the equipment along there behind it. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so It's just like any time team, same procedures. Oh, exactly. Once we know where the site is, or exactly where the layout of it is, then we can decide where to put any trenches that we've got to put in. Trenches underwater? Well, we've got to dig, haven't we? <laughs> this big diving boat is our base for the next three days. But Mick is getting a much better view of our site through his telescope. We're searching for the remains of a shipwreck in an area of sea roughly between the big boat and the shore. Simon's found cannon and what appears to be the contents of a 16th century galley scattered across the seabed here. But he hasn't found the wooden structure of the vessel. It's probably buried under 400 years of sand, so he needs our help to uncover it. The time team has never excavated a wreck site before, so we've got an awful lot to learn about underwater archaeology over the next three days. But we've already discovered that the basic principles of land archaeology also apply at sea. We still dig trenches, and we still rely on our survey results to tell us where to dig them. So while Bernard and Cathy fix a satellite datum point over our site, on board the survey boat, Karenz is discovering how underwater geophys differs from the land version. I mean, normally when we do geophysics on dry land, they will say, well, it's not working very well today because there's the moisture content of the soils wrong. Now, obviously, right. we've got a moisture is a whole different problem out here. Yeah. Um, what techniques can you use? We primarily acoustic techniques. In fact, acoustic techniques are the only way you can get any so results from the seabed. So that's sound waves, is it? High energy, low frequency sound waves to penetrate the seabed and reflect from different textures or different layers of media. So is that a bit like an ultrasound scan yeah, you might very have in a hospital? Very much like. Ultrasound oh, scan yes. are actually high frequency yes. sound, but the, uh, the effect is the same. It bounces off different layers in your body, different layers of tissue. This just bounces off different layers of rock. So this goes down from the boat, <coughs> through the water, down to the sand. Can you go through the sand? Because we've got a lot yeah. of sand on top of the wreck here. If you put enough, frequency, enough power in at low frequency, you can go through rock. I mean, oil, it's the same techniques as oil exploration to find rock. In, uh, right. wells. So you're confident that we'll be able to find the wreck? Sure, if there's anything yeah. down there, we'll see it between the sand and the rock. As well as the acoustic survey, geophys are also checking for iron remains with a floating magnetometer. This should pick up any cannonballs or ship's nails, hopefully still in their original timbers. If there are still bronze cannon down there, we should pick them up through the boat's metal detector. But even with all this equipment, it's going to take some time. So while they trawled the seabed, I was learning more about the site from the man who discovered it 20 years ago. I was swimming off the coast, uh, only about 200 yards spearfishing, and I came across this enormous bronze cannon sticking out of the sand. I didn't know what it was, of course, so I rushed home and told my old dad 
And he said, what, what is it made out of? I said, I don't know, I've no idea. And he said, well, he said, if it's made of iron, he said, I don't think it'll be worth bringing up. But he said, take this file down with you, scratch the surface, and uh, if it uh, shows a goldy colour, then it's made of bronze. Of course, we've learnt a heck of a lot since then. That's probably one of the worst things you could possibly do. Scrape away at it. Absolutely, absolutely. But it started the ball rolling. And then you were uh, able to dive the site for the next few years? We, we dived the site for two years, and, of course, it uh, attracted the attention of archaeologists, and eventually we were protected as a protected site. So the site has now been officially licensed by the Department of the Environment? What does that actually mean? It means, Tony, that uh, we need an archaeologist that uh, can come and dive with us. And we're very lucky, you know, we've got a chap called Chris Priest, who's our archaeological director, and uh, he's really shown us how to do it properly, and uh, he keeps an eye on us, and he understands the physical difficulties out there, especially the sand. So can we dive today? No, I'm afraid you can't, not until Chris is home. This is the guy who's flying back from Libya? Absolutely, absolutely. And so we can't, we can't dive today? I'm afraid you can't, not in until he gets back. back? Yes. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed that uh, the flight's going to work out all absolutely, right. Absolutely, absolutely. Since that first discovery, Simon had recovered another five guns and a whole host of other objects from the site. Back on dry land, Mick and Robin were off to the town museum to test the local view that these finds point to an armada connection. Cool, oh, that's good, isn't it? It's massive, isn't it? Cool. Yeah, it's a cooking pot. It comes like from the copper. Church Rocks wreck, which we think was part of the Spanish armada which sailed up the channel in 1588. Oh, right, so we're dealing with the armada. We think so. Mm. Yeah. What other things have you got then that suggest the armada and, and the 1588? Well, we've got a fire pot. Well, what's that? This is this little thing here, yeah. which is a 16th century hand grenade. <laughs> ah, right. Oh, right. Yeah. Which is very rare because as they were built for destruction, yes. there's <laughs> yeah. not many left. Yeah. What about this thing here? That, looks oh, like this a... that looks, was brought this up in. Fascinating. Yeah, that was brought up in 1992. Cool. It's a merchant seal, we think. It's um, about 13th to 15th century with the initials, and you have the cross, which was quite uniform then. Come on, I can't wait. I can't, we we no, passed the on. cannon on, on the, the way in. And we've got to see the cannon. <laughs> Well, there were two, there were six cannon in all brought up. Cool. There were two minion, which is this one, yeah. made by Sigismund Arbogetti in Venice, we think um, between about 1570 and 1600. Yeah. And there again, we've matched this with other guns yeah. from other yeah. wrecks. Presumably one of the things, Robin, that we should be doing is looking at the, the background to these this weekend. I mean... Absolutely. Uh, um, I mean, I, I had a look at your booklet earlier. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, the, the one that uh, went to Pendennis Castle, um, the Seiko, was it? That's the Seiko, yeah. Uh, actually has a coat of arms on it. Yes. Right. And we've got photographs of that back in the incident room. Right. And I think that yeah. could very well provide us with the clue as to who they were produced for. That would be a useful thing for us to do, well, then, be Mike, very to, useful. To, yes, to we'd love to. No, yeah. Okay. Know. So well, the prime that's... clues to the identity of the wreck yeah. rest in that coat of arms and that merchant seal. Right. Could our wreck really be a 16th century Mediterranean war galley sailing as part of the Spanish Armada? The museum certainly thinks so, and it's given Victor something to go on. But the cannon Simon found is Venetian and could have been cast 50 years before or 20 years after the Armada set sail. And the merchant seal certainly suggests a much earlier date. So we could be looking for a merchantman, not a war galley, a vessel possibly en route to trade with Tynmouth. While we survey for remains of our wreck at sea, on land, the search is on for a port contemporary with our wreck. Yep, right. Now, from this point on, we begin to pick up lanes on the left-hand side, going southwards as well, which was well, nice. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 A French raid burnt Tynmouth to the ground a hundred years after the time of our ship. The buildings around the present harbour all appear to be much later in date, but local legend claims some buildings survived this burning. If there is anything left standing of our 16th century port, even a chimney, then our buildings expert, Berwick Morley, will find it. Out in the bay, the survey of our wreck site was complete. On previous dives, Simon had found bits of broken timber from the hull of the ship, so we were all keen to find out how much of our vessel had survived under the sand. We finished the survey. Um, 
but it hasn't shown anything up. Nothing at all? I don't think so, no. That's right, isn't it, Clive? Nothing's really yes, shown up. Yes, there we go. There's our, our printout. What we've got is uh, we did the whole of the protected area, yeah. starting from line one there, and every five metres down to line 30. We did 30 lines. This is the last one. And what we should see is between the sea surface and the first layer of rock here, if there was anything hard down there, it would show. It would show. Yeah. And nothing has come up within your wreck area site there. And you've tried the sonar as well. Yeah. The, we've, yes. we've got this, well, this we had covers three different site. techniques. We really thought we'd hit something. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but Clive, why hasn't the ship's timbers shown up? Well, if they're waterlogged, they, they'll have the same acoustic density as, uh, as the sand will. So, so what you're saying well. then is that um, this particular survey won't show up timbers? Not waterlogged timbers. Now, if they're hardwood with some air trap in them, yes. ideal targets. But, uh, but not these type of timbers? Soft timbers, soft, particularly waterlogged. Yeah. Simon, how long have you been waiting for this survey? Uh, 20 years, Tony. So oh you must dear. be gutted. Um, yes, I, I was hoping to see a nice the shape, shape of, of a ship, ship. yes. <laughs> but, so, uh, so what do we do now? Well, I think we just have to accept this hasn't worked and it would be nice if it had. Um, I and mean, we know where the wreck is still. We, we know there are timbers down there. Um, I think we just have to sort of press on and see if we can get down and have a look at it. Um, and unfortunately, this, this hasn't shown anything up this time. You know what geophysics is like. <laughs> With nothing to show from our survey, Victor and Sue are using a little artistic licence to reconstruct what our boat could have looked like. It's a nice try, but let's hope this isn't all we have to show for our efforts at the end of the weekend. Nine o'clock in the evening, and Mick and I are at the airport waiting to meet the site's underwater archaeologist, Chris Priest. He's already half a day late, and if he doesn't arrive tonight, we can't dive the site tomorrow morning. That looks like him. Yeah. Hi, yeah. <laughs> oh, Chris. Well, we, we, we thought we'd spot you easy enough as well. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> we're, nice very, we're very pleased to see you. We've got lots to talk about. So we've got a vehicle. Let's go sort you out there first. Okay, okay. okay you okay with that? Let's go. So. End of day one, we've got Chris, thank goodness. We've got a boat which everybody seems to think is an Armada boat, but we're having serious doubts about whether it is or not. And we're not sure whether there's anything left under the water for us to find, but uh, at least Phil and I, first thing tomorrow morning, we'll be getting into our dive suits, and that'll be something worth hanging around until part two for. See you after the break. Day two, 10 to 8 in the morning, about uh, an hour off high tide, and I still haven't got a clue where we're going to dive. But time team are sitting down to a pretty swanky looking breakfast. Good morning, Tony. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Chris, what's yes. the plan for today? Well, um, we've decided basically that it would be a good idea to look at this area here, where uh, in the pre archaeological days, if you like, in the salvage days, they came across these timbers, but uh, it would be interesting to find out what these timbers are, whether they're stern timbers or bow timbers, mm. that would tell us more about the orientation of the vessel when it broke up. It's just like on land, Tony, it's a sort of evaluation trench going in to see the extent and sort of preservation of the site, except it's underwater. How do you <laughs> dig a trench underwater? Uh, with a lot more difficulty than you do on land, <laughs> <laughs> especially since the, the sand is mobile and keeps backfilling in, which is a problem. But basically we use water lifts, which are like um, well, giant vacuum cleaners, I suppose, mm. and they suck away the sand and uh, we see what's below. Archaeologically speaking, the principles are the same. You know, we excavate carefully and slowly and uh, record as we go along. And how long will it take to dig one of those pits? Well, I would think with four water lifts, with any luck, we can do it in a day. But uh, we're going to be pushed, and it's a good thing we've got the extra divers, I think. So if there's nothing in the first pit, then actually we're going to be pretty pressed for time, aren't we? We've only got like a day and three quarters. Well, what are we doing sitting around? I'll yeah. finish my question. Well, that's right. That's Let's right. get diving. Get, get, get cracking. We're going to dig our trench close to where Simon discovered the first cannon. Our survey suggests we won't find any more metal down here, but Chris believes we stand a good chance of finding some part of our wooden ship. 
The broken timbers Simon found here 20 years ago suggest either the front of our ship, the bow, or the stern, its back. We need to uncover intact timbers to decide which. If these have been preserved, then it will be here, buried in the deep sand beyond where the other guns and objects were found. However, Chris is concerned that the survey results may mean that any remains have been swept away by last year's unusually stormy seas. These bad storms prevented any excavation of the site last year. So no one has been able to dive down to the site for well over 12 months. So Chris and Simon are extremely anxious to get into the water as soon as possible to check that everything is okay before they allow us amateur divers to join them. Yeah, just pass it down. Turn off. The storms that prevented diving last year also moved most of the team's marker boys. So Chris and Simon's first job is to locate the area of the site we're going to excavate. At the moment, their only source of reference to the surface is the GPS datum point we laid in yesterday. We're in luck. Simon's been able to find a marker boy still in place. By measuring along the sand from this one point, Chris can start to recreate the underwater grid we'll need to mark out our trench. Ten feet down, and in this visibility, that isn't as easy as it sounds. But as soon as the markers are in place, we can get the sand suckers in and begin the real archaeology. Back on deck, our land archaeologists are watching their underwater counterparts closely. All oh, right, so this is um, laying out, That's right. finding a yeah. position. It's just like working on dry land, isn't it? It's <laughs> exactly the same. Jack, you can't talk to people. Two of them, no, we've only got this one. Is your, this is your buoy line, isn't it? Oh, and so that's so his that's point staring. of reference, and then you'll measure off from that. Right, so later on, if we can measure up from that and then get a, uh, get a point from the GPS. Looks like they've got the trench surveyed in then. Brilliant. So we're ready to start. How'd it go? Uh, not too bad. We haven't actually finished laying out the trench. It's taking a bit longer than we thought. But, uh, why is that? Hmm? Why? Why? Because uh, it's hard work lugging weights around and just getting the measurements and doing it. But uh, we're getting there. What was the visibility like? It's pretty uh, good. Two metres totally, is good for this yeah, side. Not yeah. bad. Yeah. Not bad, and it's certainly getting clearer as well, I think. Yeah, there's a bit of a plankton bloom in the water, but uh, apart from that, it's OK. You couldn't see um, any bits of wood? Oh, no, no, we no, haven't no. started. It's, it's well excavated. buried. Yeah. Well buried. Yeah. Why don't you come down and have a look? Please. Let's come back in, yeah? Okay. Show you what we've done. Yeah. That was all the encouragement I needed. I'm no pro diver, and Phil is a complete novice, so to start with, we'll be taking turns to visit the site. Underwater, they're finishing off laying out the trench. This is much more difficult than on dry land. An inch out either way in this visibility, and our trench could completely miss any evidence of the ship at all. This is where I say goodbye for goodbye to the world. Half an hour. All right, Tony, hold yep. it onto your face in the position that you like it, and I will put the spider over. Mm -hmm. Right, when you're ready. Tony, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see the other two divers? What they're doing is trying to create a trench so we can look at the timbers. Chris, how long can they work under here doing this sort of work? Well, approximately an hour, an hour and a half at this depth. Very exhausting. The water everything takes two or three times as long as on land. I'm directly over the place where the wreck is at the moment. It's covered 
by about three foot of sand, I think. So this is where we'll put the dredger. How'd it go, Tony? It was brilliant. It was great fun. It's very tiring. I think the problem is that actually it's pretty shallow there. And so you have enormous trouble keeping your buoyancy right because you've got to keep low enough to be able to do your work, but you've got to be able to keep high enough so that you're not scraping the sand all the time and causing the visibility to get worse. You can see on the monitor yeah, it's a bit you're, murky, but you're, you're right at low tide at the moment, so it can only get better. Yeah, I think it'll be easier once it gets deeper. I saw some of the divers coming out earlier and they were touching their toes for about five minutes after they got out, before they even took their kit off or anything because their backs were hurting so much. The problem is you're carrying, you know, 25, 30 pounds on your back and you're pushing against it all the time in order to keep straight so you can do the work that's required. So you but, want to do some of that then? Um, yeah. Well, we'd better get you out then. <laughs> Meanwhile, Robin's trying to trace the coat of arms on our ship's cannon. If he's successful, then we should know the name and nationality of the owner of our vessel. After that, finding out what it was and where it was going ought to be easy. Yeah, we just slide it. About to there. Then if we have... I think we'll be able to get that far. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, right, right, now we'll slide forward. Nick's keen to find out exactly how 16th century sailors would have loaded and fired these huge metal cannon on board a moving ship. He's enlisted the help of armoury expert right, so Nick Hall. Here, Nick? This, is, this is a replica, presumably. It is a replica, um, and obviously you can't fire original guns no, for well, this period. Well, you, you shouldn't, should you? Really? <laughs> well, you, you damage them. <laughs> Can you take me through how, how they would have worked this? From the beginning to the end. Yeah, yeah. Let's, he... go, let's go over and get the bits. That okay, we need I'll give you a hand. The key to firing any gun is to create a charge large enough to propel your shot. But you need an awful lot of gunpowder and wadding to fire a heavy 16th century cannonball. That is actually yeah, the, the, the powder chamber. Um, as far as we know, the powder <laughs> would be poured in loose. Yeah. And then there'd be a, a wad on top. Now, on land, um, hay was a commonly available material, right, or yeah. dry grass that yeah. you could just um, find, because most campaigns, as you know, were fought in the summer anyway. Yeah, yeah. But on, on a ship, oakum is the most uh, common sort of material. Oh, this is, material. this is bits of string, um, is it? And um, you put some of that in, ram it down on top of the powder. Right. Now, what have we missed out? Um, well, apart from putting the... The gunpowder, you mean? Well, we yeah, we put. We assume we've got gunpowder. Um, we've got the top wad. We want to hit the um, enemy, don't we? So we need a projectile. Ah, right. Now I've popped one down here. This this is actually one found locally. It's um, it it wouldn't actually probably be fired from this gun. But is this but roughly the right size it, for, it, this, it's, for this it's, gun? It's, is it's, it? Yes, but it would be it would be loaded at this end. Uh, ah, yeah, it, it is fraction, actually slightly too big. It's a fraction yeah. big, but it was one that was uh, from the site, so we thought we'd just um, right, so show it, how that would be. But they would, they would put it in, in here? in there. OK, so we've got our ball so in. So assume we've loaded a ball. We've got a chamber We've got a, uh, here. a chamber in there. Let me pass that one to you. If you hold it, it's like a beer tank, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, made of metal. yeah, and it's got the little hole in the top. Yeah. If so you, that if then you drops in there, does it? That's OK. That's fine. So that goes up into the back of there. Pop that in there, and then you see this big wedge here? If you ah to right, this this thing here, yeah, um, and that obviously and goes in the back, doesn't it? Goes in there. Do That's we actually right. have to knock that in? Yeah, yeah I've, right I've in brought there. a. a so lot we go. Once the charge is firmly in place, all we need to send the ball on its way <laughs> is a little more gunpowder and a 16th century match. On the order from the gun. This, this would be lit. Yes, sorry, sorry, that would yeah. be lit. Um, you would touch it off. And like bang, that. off it to go. Midday, and we're finally ready for the sand sucker to go into the water. I've come across the first major difference between land and underwater archaeology. On land, we'd use a JCB to dig a trench this deep, but underwater, we have to use a huge vacuum cleaner that just gently hoovers up the sand. The sand from our trench is sucked up to the surface and spewed out several metres away from the excavations. 
This will prevent it flowing straight back into the hole we've just dug. Back on land, there's more to be done to find our 16th century port. The development of the estuary may give us clues to its location. Then we get to the, the point that we're, we're really interested in, um, the 16th, 17th century period. What's happening now is the spit's built up and it's a series of, of banks, and gra uh, banks of gravel, high points and low points. The channel has got narrower and these deposits behind have started to force the main river flow out round a bend round there. And round that bend is where it achieves its, the river flowing out achieves its maximum force and therefore starts to scour Very deep. deep. Yeah. And the hydrographic soundings provided by the Admiralty confirm this is the deepest point here. And so this will provide a deep water access to that point there. And, and crucially, harbor, absolutely, yeah. Victor, yeah. It's, it, that's where you get the natural shelter. <clears throat> so you've got yeah. deep water and the natural harbour developing. So that the, the, the ship could in fact have been coming into Tynmouth itself? It's, it's quite possible. I mean, the survey that I was doing yesterday with, with, with Berwick and Mick around the town, we were coming to the same conclusions that at this early date we got from this map here where there's buildings in this inlet by 1727, it's silted up before then, all indicate that this has been settlement and, and activity in this area has been going on a lot longer than anybody else has, has ever thought of yeah. in that part of town. Well, that's brilliant because it actually gives us a link between the ship and the town, doesn't yes, it? We haven't yeah. had that before. It seemed that the town was later and that we couldn't tie them in, but yeah. the possibility that the ship could be actually be coming into that harbour, that's, that's great. Right. <laughs> on the front, Mick was now primed and ready to give us all a lesson in sea <laughs> warfare. Oh, he's the gun captain, that? I know. Right, there we are then. I'm going to shove these down here. OK then, Nick. Where's the other one? You're going you're gonna to load these for us? Yeah. Shall I get the barrel cleaned while yeah, you're doing that? Oh, you do that. that. Oh, oh, he knows the technical terms. The technical, the technical stuff, term. right? And that you can see he's used to sweeping the floors at home, <laughs> can't you, with a mopping? And that goes into there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so look at that. It's emerged. There it is. <laughs> so it cleans all around. Right. 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 You have to imagine that this is on the edge oh, of the ship here as well. It goes the other way. Yeah, we have. I have to go and fill that my <laughs> measure. Oh, oh right. I am being very really up in this now. <laughs> right, so we're ready to go then. Yeah. Well, it's it's Right. Yep. And a bit of powder. Let's have that yeah. This is the priming powder, <laughs> which communicates flame to the main charge inside the chamber. Meek, ready. <laughs> okay, <laughs> mate. Yeah. Fire. <laughs> you get one hell of a blast standing here. Yeah. From that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> As the sun set over the yard arm, our sand sucker had been going for five hours. It was time to see what, if anything, we'd uncovered. Phil's curiosity to see an underwater trench had finally overcome his reluctance to try out his newly acquired diving skills. He was ready to take the plunge. What's it like down there, Phil? It's like uh, a sort of pea super, really. I can't see much, except I'm lying on the seabed and I'm looking into a damp great hole. Phil, it's Carranza. Can, can you see any, any timbers or anything down there? I mean, it looks a bit empty here. Are you along the bottom of the trench now? Over. I'm not, I'll just uh, see if I can get my buddy to take me down into it now. Brilliant. Irony, Karen. So, yes, it probably doesn't carry on the This is the trench. There we go, the top of the air lift. And this is the trench. Go down to the bottom of the trench. Timbers, uh, we haven't got any of them. There's a lot of sand. Over. 
I come out, take some more sand out, try again yeah. tomorrow, yeah. Okay, Phil, come up now and we'll get the pump turned back on as quickly as possible, okay? Okay. End of day two and no wreck yet. But our investigations back on shore have been a success and armed with their findings, the land lovers from our team are venturing out onto the high seas to join us aboard ship. So where have we got to today? I'm going to drop a bombshell, or possible bombshell, because the heraldry, in other words, the coat of arms on the Saker, might indicate a possible Dutch origin, and therefore it may very well be a Dutch merchantman. <laughs> you're looking, you're looking sceptical. <laughs> open verdict, Does open that verdict. the fines you've had off it at all? Mm, not particularly, although, to be fair, I wouldn't exclude the possibility of it being of Dutch origin. We've had a fairly fruitful day then over there, mm. but it's pretty <laughs> frustrating here, isn't it, Chris? Well, yeah, we've had a fairly typical day here. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sand here is very mobile. There's a considerable depth of it, and uh, how, it's how fairly... much further should we have to go down to get that? I, well, looking at the trench on the last dive, I don't think we're deep enough yet uh, to hit the timbers. How and much deeper do you think? Another foot? To another couple of feet, foot, I would think. And do you think we can get that clear tonight? It depends who's willing to work on. <laughs> I see water. them working on it now. Actually, yes, I mean, Chris, if they yeah. carry on for a few more hours, I would have thought so. We're going to keep the sand sucker going until dark, though it seems less and less likely that we'll be the ones to finally uncover the Timmouth wreck. Still, let's hope we wake up tomorrow morning to hear they've found some timbers. Day three, they were sucking up sand till just before midnight last night, and again, first thing this morning. Well, they seem to have stopped now, I don't know why that is. And as you can see, the weather's changed. Still, for once, that's not going to affect time, team, is it? We're not going to get any wetter excavating down there than we did yesterday. I hope we find something. While we struggled with the elements on board ship, on slightly drier land, Mick and Berwick were off to the pub. For once, their visit had real archaeological importance. The pub is where we now believe the old port was. And Berwick believes he's discovered proof that this building survived Tynmouth's destruction by fire. If he's correct, then the Jolly Sailor could be the only building in the town contemporary with our wreck. Oh, I see. Oh, oh look at that. That's, <laughs> That's good. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's safe to my way. Oh, it's boarded out up here. Good. Yep, so we shouldn't be putting our foot through the ceiling, fortunately. Oh, that's good, isn't yeah. it? Now, right, what do you reckon then? I mean, oh, I'd, say, I reckon... I'd say that was early-ish. Yes, how early? I'll tell you. Oh, I don't know. I'll tell you, I can... Not, not good on roofs. This is amazing, because particularly that tie beam yeah. there is very special. The whole thing is of a medieval type, but it's fairly scrappy work compared with an ordinary medieval yeah. roof. But there's something very special that shouts out at that, about this roof, and it's that beam over there. Yeah. That tie beam has very funny joints. The way it's the jointed end. into the, the main the, truss there. That's right. It's not just lapped over as a straight yeah. thing. Yeah. It's just got a nick in the top, the top and it's and got bottom, a sort of nick is. in the bottom yeah. in the bottom as well. Yeah. And and that sort of joint is basically, funny enough, a, a, an eleventh. A 12th and 13th century cool. thing, but in the southwest here, it has a re-emergence very peculiarly yeah. in the 17th century. Good lord! So this is a so 17th century. I would roof. say almost certainly this must be a 17th century roof. Great. Late, late 16th, first half of the 17th that, century. That's incredible, isn't it? Well, it's certainly before the time of the French raid. Yeah. yeah. And, and gives us a building which, at last, we've seen a building in the town that we can say, "Yep, this was a building that survived the French raid." What a discovery. Yeah, it's tremendous. We've found a contemporary building, but we still have to find our ship.
Daryl, this is Tony here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. In our shot, there is something long and black by the sand sucker. What is that? That's that there. Is that Roger? Roger. What is that? Uh, that's timber, Roger. Did you say timber? Yeah. Timber from the wreck? That's a Roger. <laughs> okay, can you stand by? Simon, Tris. Yes, Mike. Yes, they have found some wood. Oh, great! And I said to him, "Is it? Is it uh, from the wreck?" And, yeah. and he said, "Roger." So yeah. Yeah. Oh, good stuff. Great. It's all right. Great. Phil, great. can you hear me? It's Tony. Oh, that's a relief. Tony, this is Phil. Over. They found some wood. Can you get down there as quickly as possible and and tell us what it is? Uh, okay, Tony. Thank goodness. I was beginning to lose my bottle a bit. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Uh, I was getting very nervous, actually, but we knew it was down there, and yeah, uh, yeah. it was just a matter of time, I think. Daryl, did you find the wood yourself, or was it revealed by the sand sucker? It was revealed as we're going along with the sand sucker going down. Yeah. It's, uh, it's about four feet down. And how much of it is there? Uh, about 18 inches, two feet. And is that the lot? Oh, no, it's just, just keep going. So, uh, yeah, we just chased it along, and I don't know how far we're going to go along, but it uh, seems like we're obviously on the river or something, you know. And any other evidence down there? Um, what is that? What is it? Absolutely no idea. Chris? Chris? Yeah. Is this anything? Ah, yeah, that is something. That's uh, a concreted ship's nail. See the timber there, it's come off the top. What do you mean, concreted? Well, there's a chemical reaction occurs in, in salt water with uh, iron yeah. and other minerals. I mean, you can see the bits of stone and bits of shell in here. You see the shell there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you get a, a sort of, con well, concretion, rather like a concrete lump on top. But so there wouldn't necessarily still be a nail there? It might have just No, dissolved. you might just have a ghost uh, imprint. Oh, so it's what they call a ghost nail? A ghost nail, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's our first That's find of the weekend. That's a ship's nail. Yeah, well, you can see the timbers there, yeah. The line of the timber there. Phil was now ready to see the timbers for himself. Okay, that's the most phenomenal thing I think I've ever seen. I've seen a few sights in my time, but I've never seen anything quite like that. I mean, it's just this enormous hole in the ground, and it's there's just this constant flow of sand just tweetering down into it. This enormous great big sucking tube that is taking it all away and visibility is, is pretty awful and yet at the bottom of it all there's this unmistakable piece of timber <laughs> Part of our boat is still intact, but we need to uncover more to find out which part and to reconstruct what it looked like. Oh, it's great with long hair. Oh. Isn't it? So, what did you see? Oh, oh, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. How big was it? I reckon it must be yay big across, and you could then I managed to get my fingers down the side of it. I don't know whether I quite got the bottom of it, but it looked felt I felt as like my fingers were going underneath. There it is, ship's timber. It's unbelievable. And does it look like there's any more of it? Yeah, at one stage, I mean, when I first saw them, the the sucker, you could see what I'm sure that were like just like the planks, the, the planking on this deck, series of them, and then as they moved the sucker across, of course, what I'd seen before all silted back over. And uh, you've got another one, and it's it, it was just you know it just disappears into the sand on both sides. Have you seen this? Oh wow! Yeah, well that's it. See, see what I'm telling you. Look, I mean, well you can see that's wood, but you tap it, it's like iron. Unbelievable. It's metallic, really metallic. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, presumably it's a nail, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... look, you suppose it's it's like well, you're virtually sat on one, ain't you? I mean, aren't we looking at something like, something like that? But I mean, I don't know anything much about boats, but when you start looking at boats, and we're on one, it's you kind of realise what, you know, they're exactly the same really, aren't they? Timber and nails. Yeah. 
Stewart's studies show Tynmouth's estuary would have provided a safe haven for any vessel, but he now believes the currents outside it would have been treacherous, and it was probably these that led to the destruction of our ship. Armed with this information, and after a night's sober reflection, Robin's reviewing his conclusions. Last night you said that you thought the coat of arms on the cannon was probably Dutch, which indicated it might be a Dutch wreck that we've got here. I, I was very careful last night. I said it was a possible identification. Um, I reckon if you went right the way through European heraldry, you'd find a dozen families that would fit what we've been able to decipher on that gun. Bombshell so, was the word you used. <laughs> what you're saying is you no longer think it's Dutch. I'm afraid so, yeah. Um, it could, each individual uh, section on that coat of arms could represent an individual merchant that clubbed in towards the purchase of this particular bit of armament. Yeah. So I, th I, th I don't think that, uh, although it's a possible identification, there are other factors that lead me to believe otherwise. Which are what? The, uh, the merchant seals? Well, for a start, we've got the, the guns which we know were Venetian in origin. Yeah. The two merchant seals uh, lead me to suspect that uh, it has to be a trading vessel rather than a fighting vessel. Why do you reckon this boat was here? I th reckon that it probably went down in a storm, possibly trying to head into Tynmouth behind us and failing abysmally. Not only that, but probably that it went down at night in a fierce storm. Otherwise, uh, the locals would have been out and taken those cannon ages ago because it's relatively shallow water. And if they knew that a vessel had gone down, uh, then they'd have, it would have been rich pickings as far as they were concerned. I, mean, you, uh, I don't know whether you've seen the guns themselves, but they're incredibly rich specimens. You have to ally with that the fact that almost certainly every single man on the boat drowned in that storm. Because right. if one had got ashore, uh, the inhabitants would have found out from him that there were those rich pickings just below the surface. So we have a Venetian merchantman, last 30 years of the 16th century, on a trading voyage to some port along this coast. Could have been Tynmouth, possibly more likely to have been Exeter, which was a larger port at that time. Caught in a storm, goes down, loss of all hands at night. We've got time for just one more dive, but it looks like I may have to go alone. After three days on a boat, the uh, sea has I mean, finally got the better of Phil. I mean, I suppose if I stay up here and have a look at it in the monitor, then you can get on with it. Maybe that's the best thing. You know, I mean, I'd really like to see it, but I'd like to see it in like a couple of weeks' time when, yeah, I, when I don't have to go now. I'll stay up there. Yeah. Phil's yeah. bound to feel better when he gets out of his dive gear, but with just an hour's dive time left, there's no more time for sympathy. We have to get down and see how much of our ship we've managed to uncover. Can you work out which side of the boat this is? Chris, to me, this looks like the outside. Could this be the keel here? Hey, the top edge of some of the timbers. Look over the top here, the other side. It looks like it carries on to some way here as well. Got quite a bit more to uncover, I think. It's actually very romantic. Tony, this is Phil. You receiving me over? I can hear you, Phil. The landward contingent up here with me would like you to swim from one end of the timber to the other to show how long it is. Can you do that for us, please? Over. Yes, I will. I'll get Chris to do it too. Oh, that's Chris there, isn't it? That's Chris there, yeah. Stop. Okay, Chris. It's fantastic. I know we've got a whole ship's deck here. We can see the traces of every nail. 
We can see the gaps between the planks so clearly. So how does this compare with uh, archaeology on land, Phil? Well, I mean, it's beginning to look like uh, archaeology on land, but it's probably... Yeah, I guess it's sort of archaeology and land in sort of early September, you mm. know, mists and <laughs> where, where is it <laughs> when I saw it, when I saw it was nearer November. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean, it's it's exactly the same technique. Mm. I mean, I I gotta I gotta say I gotta take my hat off to you guys. I mean, working down there. Land archaeology is going to be so easy from now on in, I tell you. I will never complain about the cold. I will never complain about the visibility. I will never complain about the wet. It's amazing to think that there's the remnants of a Venetian ship just about 40 yards from the coast. It makes you wonder how many more skeletal forgotten wrecks there are off the British coastline. We've come a long way from Simon's first discovery. We've uncovered the stern of our boat, complete with the stern post that attached the ship's rudder to its hull. And although we don't have enough evidence to gauge the exact size of our ship, other Venetian merchantmen of this age were about 80 feet long. As well as a full cargo, we know our merchantmen would have carried six guns for protection. It may well have been heading for shelter in Tynmouth's harbour, which we believe contained a prosperous 16th century port. It never made it. And the position of our timber suggests that the ship broke in two, scattering its contents and guns over the seabed to be buried by the sand. It's hard to describe how eerie it is when you excavate a piece of land archaeology. Once you've cleared the earth away, it's just kind of there and it... It immediately begins to dry off and really look rather dead. But the magical thing about what we've just seen is that as soon as you've seen it, the sand moves in again and starts to cover it up. And then you just wave your hand and it reveals itself again. And all the time, different bits of it are revealing themselves to you. And then as soon as you swim away from it, the whole thing gets covered up again. <sighs> Something else. 